uh, Pat Langley can come and visit. So Pat's the director of the Institute for the Study of Learning and Expertise, and he's also a research scientist now at the Stanford Center of Design Research. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah, oh, it's it's really long story. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Um, more importantly, Pat's been working in machine learning and scientific uh, discovery for years and years and years. I, I first met him back in, what does this show, my age, 1986, at a machine learning conference. Pat, uh, we were reminiscing last night, I credit him with introducing experimental rigor to the early days of machine learning when people weren't even doing proper experiments. So he made huge contributions there. And, and then from our perspective here with some of the work we're doing. Chaos essentially founded the idea of AI and scientific discovery, he created that whole um, genre of research starting back in the, uh, I guess, late 80s. Arguably Ar Ar with Herb Simon. Yeah. So, right. So uh, so he's been exploring this for, for years and years, and uh, he's going to um, tell us okay, he's going to pull some out. So. I'm, I think I'm going to stay back here because he, this is such a great echo. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's okay. Yeah, and I've worked in many other areas too. I've worked in in natural language, computer vision, uh, reasoning. A lot of it with learning, but not all of it. Um, I'm I'm really an AI generalist who happens to have been in on the ground floor when we launched machine learning back in in the 1980s. Uh, I was the first editor of the journal Machine Learning, and and uh, Peter can tell you what I'm like as an editor because I edited his most cited paper. And uh, I hope I was not, I was reasonably gentle. Um, right, so this is an expanded version of my AAAI talk. So if you don't like this version, you can either wait and go to Vancouver in a month, or you can go to my website because it's up there and it's re the recorded 20 minute version. Um, integrated systems for computational scientific discovery. I wanna thank all of my collaborators over the decades who have influenced uh, these ideas and also my current funder at AOSR. So science is distinguished from many other, other fields, um, uh, like law and religion, I mean, many, many complex human activities. Science is distinguished because it relies on formal laws, models, and theories of observed phenomena. I'm thinking about things like Kepler's law of planetary motion, Newton's theory of gravitation, Krebs citric acid cycle, uh, Dalton's atomic theory, many others, okay? And we talk about the process of finding these accounts as scientific discovery. The term discovery is a little broader. Sometimes, you know, if someone finds a, a new a new planet, it's, it counts as a discovery. But mostly, we mean things like this. Now, philosophers of science for a long time said this is impossible. Um, they 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 talked about. The, how you could decide whether a scientific model or theory was was good, was accurate, was correct. But they said, no, you can't even talk about, about the discovery process. A popper, who was very influential uh, in philosophy of science in the last century, wrote, um, the initial stage, the act of conceiving or inventing a theory, seems to me neither to call for logical analysis nor to be susceptible of it. My view, maybe, is that Every discovery contains an irrational element or a creative intuition, okay? And he wasn't the only one. Many people followed his lead. Uh, Carl Hempel, who was a leading philosopher of science at the University of Pittsburgh, said the same kind of things. I encountered this when I was an undergraduate in a philosophy of science course. And I said, what? Yeah, that's crazy, because I was interested in AI even back then. And I said, we could do this. And it turned out that uh, there were some early discussion of this um, because there were these breakthroughs in the 50s, late 50s, both in cognitive psychology and in what came to be called artificial intelligence that said maybe there was a way. And in fact, when I was an undergraduate, I read this book chapter by a fellow named Herbert Simon, who happened to be one of the founders of artificial intelligence. And he's argued that scientific discovery is just a variety of problem solving, okay? R problem solving writ large. It involves search through a space of problem states, that those states are generated by operators from previous states, and that you guide the search using heuristics so that in order to make things tractable. Already by the mid-60s, 
heuristic search had been implicated in many cases of human cognition, um, complex cognition, from proving theorems to, to playing chess, many other things. Okay? And so Simon's proposal was, well, we can use the same idea to explain what's going on uh, in scientific discovery, both, both historically, how humans do it, but also to automate it. In fact, the process isn't really mysterious. We just need to actually go about this. I read this chapter, I said, I got to work with this guy. In fact, that's how I ended up going to CMU, specifically to work with Herb Simon on scientific discovery. Now you can state the task. There are many kinds, different types of discovery, but if you're gonna have some very generic statement of it, this is what I would say. Is it, you describe any computational abstraction in terms of inputs and outputs, right? Without talking about how you do it. You're given scientific data or phenomena because it could be higher level kind of stuff. You want to describe it, summarize it, or explain it. Uh, you have some knowledge, and you always do have some knowledge about the about the domain. Some of that could be constraints, could be heuristics, uh, could be prior knowledge, uh, sort of initial uh, models. Um, and you also, in some way, have specified a space of possible candidate uh, laws, hypotheses, or models. So there's going to be a search space. Now, I mean, if you're familiar with the heuristic search idea, you don't enumerate these in advance, right? You specify an initial state, you specify some operators for generating new states, and you specify a termination criterion. So it can be a very small specification of the space, but the space could be giant. Um, but you have to define that. And what you want to do now is find laws or models that describe or explain those observations that, that fall in that space. Now, according to Simon, we could formulate discovery as heuristic search through this space of candidates. And over the past 50 years, this idea has been incredibly productive. It's led to many successful AI discovery systems. Can I ask a question now, or do you prefer them later? Sure, unless you get out of control. Go ahead. <laughs> So quick question, um, how does this uh, align with the previous slide? The previous slide from Simon was talking about problem solving. And now you're yeah. talking about um, discovering laws, empirical laws from data. And those aren't necessarily the same, right? Now you can, you can discover a law, but not be able to solve scientific problems. So Simon viewed, so first of all, when Simon talks about problem solving, he equated that with heuristic search. The Newell and Simon theory of human problem solving in their 800 page book is heuristic search. Um, and he, what he was saying was that we can ex understand, explain and replicate scientific discovery as a process of heuristic search through a space of laws or models or explanations. Okay, so unlike say, a, say a planning system, in planning system, the states are states of the world, the operators are actions that you can carry out. The termination criterion is that you've achieved all the goals that you set up, set up to, to have. Um, in scientific discovery, the states are candidate laws or models. Um, the, the operators are ways of generating new laws or models from the previous ones and from the data. Um, and the termination criterion is a little trickier because because uh, you might not be able to fit the data perfectly, but you gotta have some way of knowing when, when it's good enough. So the idea is that scientific discovery can be viewed in terms of, and, and, and addressed in terms of heuristic search. Does that clarify? Okay, thank you. Okay, right. Just to, 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 to show you evidence of this, these are, this is a partial list of, of meetings that have, with, with, the community has held on scientific discovery over the years, starting with one that Jeff Schrager and I ran at Stanford in 1989 that led to a, to a, a book I'll show you in a minute, down to most recent, and we organized one in a AAAI symposium in last March um, that brought together sort of more people working in the classic tradition and, and people who joined, joined the, the movement more recently, I'll, and I'll have a bit to say about that too. Uh, and there were actually two other meetings last year, one that Ross King organized in Sweden, and another that was at the National Academy of Sciences in DC. So, uh, and there's another one uh, next month uh, that uh, Hiroaki Kitano is running uh, in Tokyo. So this is, seems to be a lot of excitement, interest about this. Here are some of the, the books 
that have come out of this. Uh, this was the one that I would say really put the movement on the map uh, that, that grew out of my thesis work, but had some additional stuff too. Uh, and, I won't, and this is the book that came out of that symposium that Schrager and I edited. Um, and we're doing another one based on the March symposium. So stay tuned for that. I hope that'll be out within a year. I had to say a few words about scientific discovery versus data mining. You may or may not know that when the data mining conference got launched, the ACM conference, it, it was, and I guess still is called, data mining and knowledge discovery. So they had this term discovery. In fact, there's been very, very few papers on scientific discovery in that movement, uh, and you'll see why in a minute. So there's definitely some things in common, right? They both use computational methods. They both adopt a heuristic search idea, they carry out search to a space of laws or models or whatever it is in data mining, okay? But data mining usually emphasizes commercial applications, uh, almost always focuses on large or giant data sets, and almost always uses notations that were invented by computer scientists. And I mean things like decision trees, Bayes nets, neural nets, uh, not uh, the kind of stuff you find in science. So. Uh, scientific discovery is focused really on scientific disciplines, often uses small to moderate sized data sets because despite some of the rhetoric you'll hear from astronomers, mostly scientists are not drowning in data, right? It's in, particularly in biology, it's really expensive in material science. It takes a lot of effort to get these. So, uh, and there's generally big, big focus on, on finding laws or models stated in an established scientific formulas. And I'll have more to say about that. Uh, in a bit, but that can be different in different fields, but there's still going to be something like that. Data mining methods can and have been applied to scientific data, but they seldom produce scientific knowledge in the sense of something that a scientist would recognize as knowledge. And, I'll, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll come back to this point later uh, with examples. So that was all lead up, but the real, the, the, the center of the talk is these three points. Different points, but I think complementary. Scientific knowledge discovery is a complicated and multifaceted process. It's not one thing. There are many different, different elements to it. Since the 1970s, as I mentioned, AI researchers have been automating, working on discovery, and they've been automating individual facets. But they have not been putting the pieces together. Well, a little bit. There's a, there's a few examples of this, and I'll talk about them toward the end. But But... I say that a major challenge for the field is combine these elements into integrated discovery systems to put all the pieces together. So think of it less as let's develop an algorithm for this piece that let's build a system that puts all the pieces together. So this, that's why this talk is going to have some aspects of a survey and some of it is, is what, what some people call a blue sky talk. And I can clarify this with, with from one of the oldest fields, chemistry. Um, shows both some of these facets of discovery and how they interact. So if you look at the history of chemistry, uh, it, it started off with people coming up with taxonomies, what you might call, or ontologies of chemical substances. That this was first really formalized in around, 18, around 800 AD, but of course it was going on much earlier when people were doing it informally. Um, once they had that, they could find, they could start to state a qualitative chemical reactions and that with, there was a lot of activity in that from 800 AD to 1300, and, and that continued. But these were quali these, these were stated in terms of the the taxonomy, right? The the different chemical substances. Uh, they were largely qualitative. Then, in the late 1700s, new measuring techniques let people quantify things, and now you found very quickly you find people finding finding numeric laws in chemistry like the law of definite proportions, the law of combining volumes, and others. In parallel, people were starting to develop deeper models of what was going on. So you found uh, process models of combustion, uh, like the phlogiston and oxygen models. And, and despite what you've heard, the phlogiston model was actually explained a lot of phenomena. It was perfectly legitimate. They eventually decided it wasn't, wasn't the right one, but it wasn't a, wasn't a stupid idea. Um, and then you start to find uh, uh, accounts of mo molecular structure, uh, first with inorganic molecules, as in Dalton's atomic theory, and then 
uh, around mid-century uh, organic molecules, starting with Kekulé's uh, uh, infer in, uh, is, is figuring out how the benzene ring is structured. And then it goes on and you find people in the early 1900s coming up with biochemical processes of cellular metabolism. There's lots and lots of other stuff. What I'm trying to tell you though is that there are stages and later stages are building on earlier ones. And you're going gradually from descriptive summaries of, of data to deeper explanations. And they're all complementary and they all fit together uh, but mostly people don't do that. They work on, on, on say, one of these things. All right. So I'm going to claim that there are five main types of scientific discovery, at least data-driven scientific discovery. I don't want to say that you can't have discoveries by reading the literature and finding some unexpected connection. There's some interesting AI work on that, too. Uh, but I'm going to be focusing on on stuff that's more based on, on data, because that's the classic sense that people talk about. Um, forming taxonomic hierarchies, finding qualitative laws, inducing numeric laws, sometimes called equation discovery, sometimes called symbolic regression, which I, I do not favor. I can tell you why if you really, really want to know. Um, forming structural models and generating process models. And, uh, and these can be either qualitative or quantitative. Usually you find qualitative versions first and then they, they start to add parameters to them. Um, and, and there's a, someone's, if I don't say this now, someone's gonna ask, uh, someone's gonna ask about what about causal models? And the answer is that a number of these have causal aspects to them. And I don't wanna think, I think that that's an orthogonal issue. Uh, many qualitative laws and numeric laws do have a causal interpretation. Process models do as well. And, and so there's some great work on inferring causal models in science. And I can tell you about it, but that's not the main thrust of the talk. So anyway, the argument is that we really need to understand these facets before we can talk about combining them. So that's why I'm gonna go through them. And in the process, I'll review some of the work that has happened over 50 years um, and some more recent work, but, but the point is to give you clear examples of, of what these are. So to do taxonomy formation, you're given a set of entities with descriptions for each one. For, this could be, say, organisms with their how many legs and whether they have fur or feathers or whatever. Right? Uh, and you want to organize them into classes, often a, a, a hierarchy, although it doesn't have to be, it could be flat. And you're familiar with examples about you know, the classifications of dinosaurs, different star types, uh, different types of rocks. This happens in every field of science, right? Um, there, a lot of the, the earliest work in this computational work uh, was called numerical taxonomy. It was done by people in biology um, back in the early 60s. And, um, and, you, you, and there's still work on that going on in biology. Uh, but most more of that now is, is on what's called computational phylogenetics, where they actually use uh, genomes to, to do the classification. Um, and there's many others. A lot of this stuff, people don't talk about it as scientific discovery. It's sort of so fundamental that you don't find it talked about much in literature. But I do want to tell you briefly about Autoclass because it was, uh, it got a lot of attention in the late 80s. Um, this was a probabilistic system for taxonomy formation. Uh, it it uh, represented categories in terms of means and variances over numeric attributes. Um, and it used, I'm sure you're familiar with the expectation maximization algorithm. It was, this was one of the first sexy applications of EM um, for clustering. And, uh, and it, it, it had an outer loop where it would increase it in the number of, the number of clusters until it, until it uh, wasn't doing any better. But they got, the, they applied this to 5,000 stars uh, uh, described in terms of infrared spectra and came up with a bunch of, of classes. And they actually found an, 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 an unexpected Category class of of stars uh, with it had excess infrared. Uh, they they in hindsight looked decided the astronomers decided it wasn't actually a new kind of star. It was just hidden behind some some dust. But it was still still a a, a very useful result that uh, that uh, astronomers valued. Once you've got a set of terms that come out of your taxonomy, now you can start to find qualitative laws, and you're familiar with things like chemical reactions, uh, 
ignore the fact that there's some structural information here in the notation that was not known initially. Initially, these were they, there was a law that said sulfuric acid and calcium oxide react with calcium sulfate, but they didn't even even have these names. I mean, this is, these are modern names that 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 suggest that you know what the structure is. I mean, there was a uh, there were there were really arcane names that, that alchemists were using. Uh, and we have um, relationships between predators and prey. So what animal what animals eat? What other animals? And each of these links corresponds to a qualitative law based on observations or that uh, of what what animals do in the wild. There's been a bunch of systems doing this too. Uh, the one interesting historical example I worked on was a system. Bob Bobber was a was a human chemist and we named it after him. This was a system that given chemical reactions found higher level regularities like that acids react with alkalis to form salts. But there's there's a been a lot more work that is that a lot of work on on applications trying to find new things um, and i would say that this comes the closest to mainstream data mining i said earlier that data mining and, and scientific discovery aren't the same thing but if you're going to find one place where they interact intersect a lot it's right here uh, because uh, there's rule induction at least used to be rule induction was one of the key methods in in data mining and and you uh, you find that applied to scientific data, and when you're done, you have something that is could be argued is a a qualitative law. Here's an example that Ro some of Ross King's work on uh, on inductive logic programming with a system called Progol, and um, and they were given uh, 230 compounds that had had nitrates in. Um, some of them were mutagenic; they caused mutations in, in cells, some did not. Uh, the system used a classic, now classic technique for uh, for searching through a space of rules, to find a rule that covered some cases, and then they repeat this process to find others. Uh, this is sometimes called separate and conquer. I am not sure if CN2 was the first example of it or not. Uh, maybe AQ sort of did that too, but but it, but it's a, it, came, it came out of the, in the 80s, okay? Um, and inductive logic programming basically does that over relational representations. But here's one example of something the system found. It, it didn't generate the natural language text, but it was easily converted. A compound is mutagenic if it has an aliphatic carbon atom attached by a single carbon bond in a six member aromatic ring. Okay, qualitative, but clearly clearly an empirical law. It's qualitative in form, it, it, uh, it's uh, getting at something interesting. And there was, at the same time, people building statistical models that would predict mutagenicity, but it wasn't like this. You couldn't talk about what was going on the way it did. Then there's inducing numerical laws, and I'll have more to say about this because it's been such an active area. Um, so uh, you're familiar with the ideal gas law, which is made up of three other laws, Boyle's, Charles, and Avogadro's law. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Kepler's uh, laws of planetary motion and Coulomb's law of electrostatics. Again, bunch of work um, on this uh, on this general problem. Uh, you're given a set of observed entities with numeric descriptors. You want to find one or more equations that describe what's going on there. Um, I did my thesis on a system called Bacon. I'll tell you a bit about it in a minute. Uh, Jan Zitkoff, who is one of our collaborators, uh, extended the idea uh, with a system called Fahrenheit, where he actually did was doing trying to find new results in electrochemistry. In the uh, in the mid '90s, Jarowski and Todorovsky extended the ideas in Bacon to to find differential equations that explain that 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 summarized not dynamic behavior. Particularly, they did a lot of work in ecology. And then more recently, they're starting in the in uh, in about 15 years ago. Um, with uh, Hod Lipson and his group. Uh, other people started working in this area. Um, Steve Brunton and Nathan Cutts at, at the university here, uh, they've done a bunch of stuff with a, with a system called Cindy, uh, and many more. Um, and uh, I'll say more about that in a second. Let me tell you a bit about Bacon. You're not gonna be impressed, okay? This was in the late 70s. Um, but Bacon did carry out search in, it, was, it was trying to find numeric laws. 
it had you know training cases each of them was described as in terms of attributes and values um, it was able to to run some some simple experiments like varying one thing at a time on synthetic domains it carried out search through a space not a space of laws but actually a space of theoretical terms common algebraic combinations of the variables um, so they the operators were those things. Let's multiply these two together. Let's divide this by this. Um, it had heuristics that noted regularities in data. For example, it said, well, if, if this goes up and this goes down, then maybe their product is a constant. And it would, so that would, it would try out their product and see if it was a constant. Um, and, uh, and then it would, it would, it would find a law at a given level, but then it would apply the same thing recursively to higher levels of abstraction. So it would find, for example, uh, Boyle's law, and with but different parameters for Boyle's law for different for different temperatures, and so then it would find it would find a higher level law relating those parameters to the temperature, and so on. We called it Bacon because uh, because it take, used a data driven approach, similar in spirit to what Sir Francis Bacon proposed. This is this these are the laws that Bacon. I don't know if this is exhaustive, but that uh, these are some that it found, and and you would not. You would not, you, maybe you can believe it. At the time, AI researchers were not interested in numeric processing. They, it was all symbolic. It, was all, it wasn't all logic, but it was definitely, I had people say, well, why are you working on this? Isn't this just regression? And I go, you know any regression systems that can find laws like this? And so they weren't usually convinced, but, but it became more interesting with uh, the introduction of intrinsic properties. There are things like, <clears throat> like uh, the law of refraction or, or black specific heat law, where different substances have different, different uh, there's some term like specific heat that, uh, that helps you understand what's going on. And, um, and so it's definitely not just, just coming up with a simple, this is not something that, you would, that any traditional regression method would find to. These were unobserved uh, variables that the system inferred in the process of finding these laws. <laughs> Yes. So, Claire, okay, what is the input of the system? Yes, for example, for the moment of conservation, yeah. you would see lots of data in one and two. Not, not, not a lot. We actually would see maybe maybe uh, 30 cases. Uh, but yeah, so you, you, you I gave the system some some data sets where it was uh, the momentum before, the, sorry, the, the velocity, two objects are coming together, they, they, they collide, so we have the, the velocity beforehand. And the velocities afterwards, and you do that with different pairs of objects, and and you infer mass because they behave differently, right? So I mean, we think about about mass and weight as something we measure directly, but no, it's all indirect, right? I mean, if you think about how a scale works, it's it's in mass the weight is inferred from that. So and you can do the same kind of thing here. Uh, Notice that all, all of these have, no, they're not all. The Archimedes law, I mean, this is where he got into the bathtub, right? And he, and, and he realized that the water, that this, the amount displaced must be, must be related to the volume uh, that he put in there. And, and so you can take an irregular object and put it into the water and see how much it goes up. And, and you can explain different ob objects have different shapes, different sizes. And so uh, you can infer the volume from that. Yes. So does the system have a notion of, for example, from the moment of conservation, like what's the velocity, what's the mass? For example, like would you provide the definition of velocity and mass to the system no. at priori or no. come up with it? No, you, you give it you 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 tell it that there are these objects with these with with, with attributes like the velocity um, before and the velocity after. Um, there's two objects, velocity before, velocity after. And uh, and you do not tell it the mass. It figures out that there must be something. We're going to call it mass. It didn't call it mass. Uh, that would that would account for that. You could claim this as beginnings of an explanation, but it's still a very shallow law. Okay. Um, and I, I I would claim that uh, that this is a simple kind of of uh, when you do this, you effectively now have a measuring device, right? Now, if you give it a new object. And you think it, it, you see how it fits into law, you can infer what the what the value of the intrinsic property is. I mentioned uh, I mentioned the the work that uh, Todorovsky and Jarosky did on extending Bacon to to find differential equation models. 
from time series. Um, but the, they had the, their early system did it in a pretty unconstrained way. Later, they they called their system first system Lagrange. Then they they built a version that gave it some background knowledge uh, about the kinds of equations you should consider. And they stated that knowledge as a context-free grammar. Um, and so the system would carry out search for equations starting from, from simple equations and going to more complex equations. But they, they applied this repeatedly to, to, to real sci new scientific data sets in ecology and hy hydrology and others. Um, and we're publishing, publishing in, in some of those literatures. Now, I mentioned that there's more recent work. I mean, I'm still working in this area, the Slovenians. Jorosky and Jorosky, they're still working on this area. Um, but, uh, but there's a whole new set of players here, uh, starting again with, uh, with, with this work by, by Schmidt and Lipson. But again, there's a lot of stuff across a, a mile away from here. Uh, Max Tegmark and friends, uh, this is Taylor Wu, who's a postdoc at Stanford now. They, they've all been working on discovering numeric laws or equations from data. And when they started this, they didn't know about the classic work. They didn't cite us. Uh, Lipson cited us sort of in a, in a, in a, in a miscited us, uh, but really they just didn't, didn't know about it or they didn't, certainly didn't, but, but, and, and, but they are searching through a space of, of, uh, of explicit algebraic or, or equations or differential equations. And, um, and they're really working on the same discovery task. Now, there's also people who are working on the same kind of data, but they're using neural nets. And most of them are not building interpretable models at all. They're building, they're, you've probably heard of neural ODEs, right? Which, which might have some kind of high level structure of, of ODEs, but they're, the, the, they're not really explicit equations. Um, but that's not a requirement. In fact, uh, in, the late 90s, uh, Kazumi Saito uh, did his thesis in Japan on a system. He was inspired by the Bacon work. He said he, but he liked neural nets. So he found a way to use neural net technology to discover numeric laws. Uh, he had, uh, he took, had three layer network, um, product units for, for the hidden layer. Uh, top layer was, uh, was additive units. He used gradient descent to search for parameters. Um, he had an MDL halting criterion. And then when he was done, because he was driving a lot of the weights to zero. When he was done, he would turn it back into a polynomial expression. So he was supposed to do an equation discovery using neural nets as a subroutine. Um, and uh, and uh, about 10 years later, we embedded his, well, we start, actually started around 2003, um, embedded his stuff in a larger system for doing differential equations from time series. So, so it's, uh, it's fine idea. I mean, it's, it's, it's a technology to use. The important thing is not how you do the search. The important thing is that when you're done, you have something that looks like scientific knowledge. Um, there's a, a colleague at, uh, at Stanford, uh, she's Ellen Cool, who's actually the head of, of mechanical engineering. And she uh, has been doing the same kind of thing uh, with, uh, for, for describing uh, characteristics of skin and other body parts. But, it's, uh, but she's searching the space of explicit equations using using neural net technology. <clears throat> How am I doing on time? Uh, yep. OK. Um, so the third, fourth, the fourth task. Now we're moving away from what I would call descriptive accounts and going more to explanatory accounts. So given a set of observed entities and descriptions of them, you want to find structural models uh, with inferred components that explain them. Um, examples, maps, okay? Maps, I mean, we didn't used to be able to, to go up in the air and see things, right? Maps were built by inference, by lots of measurements. Um, um, inferring the structure of, of chemicals like benzene and caffeine, inferring what the, the structure of, of the earth, the planetary layers. Um, these are all structural inference tasks. Uh, they're talking, to, they're not talking about what's going on, they're talking about just what, how these things are built. Uh, now you can have structural models that you can sort of see directly. I mean, there's lots of things that I have, I can build a structural model of a, of a person or a new animal. I can, I can, because I can see them. So that's, that's an easier version. 
here is where there's there's internal structure that you can't see directly. This happened, This a lot of the work in particle physics was like this too. Again, there's there's a fair number, not nearly as many as equation discovery, but there's a fair number of systems that, that do this. Um, one in our book uh, was called Dalton. It, it, it reproduced some of, of Dalton's reasoning about, about inorganic molecules. Uh, there's a system that Zipkoff and Fisher developed called Gelman that it built uh, models of elementary particles in terms of, of quarks. Um, and, and then there's dendrol. Now, dendrol is a very interesting case. This is, was developed by Ed Feigenbaum, uh, Joshua Lederberg, uh, Bruce Buchanan, Robert Lindsay, a big team at Stanford in, during the 70s. And when they did it, they did not, when they did this work, they didn't really talk about it as scientific discovery. They talked about it as, as uh, well, uh, actually the success with dendrol actually led to the expert systems movement. Okay, so Feigenbaum was centrally involved. Dendrol had a lot of domain knowledge about chemistry, and they tried to then generalize that. Uh, but I'd say that the later applications of expert systems were much less interesting in this. Uh, so this was the, the, uh, the, uh, the task was you're, you, you're given some background knowledge about chemistry, organic chemistry. Um, you, uh, you, uh, you actually know the, 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 uh, the component formula, like C6H5OH. Um, and, you, and you have mass spectral data on this, okay? In mass spectrum, you put a, chem, a substance in, it gets bomb, broken apart into little pieces, and then you can look at, at uh, how 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 many pieces of a particular weight molecular weight occur, and so they wanted to reconstruct things like this, and it did use heuristic search to infer these structural models, um, and it was very successful. Led to many papers in the refereed literature in organic chemistry, and it's um, well. Let me say that that there, it's very similar in spirit to a more recent system called AlphaFold, which I'm sure you've heard about which is all about inferring protein structure. Uses very different techniques, uses very, you know, um, is all about uh, deep neural networks. Um, when, if you hear um, the developers of AlphaFold talk about it, they will not recite Dendrol because they probably see no connection because they're obsessed with their technology rather than with, with the problem. Um, but the other thing is that AlphaFold is actually trained on, on, on thousands of cases of of how proteins have folded, um, given given the given the the, the protein sequence, and uh, and you'd say, well, then they're doing more than dendrol. But in fact, dendrol was not just this system. There was a part of that project called metadendrol, which is about learning the rules of fragmentation. In fact, Tom Mitchell did his thesis uh, in in that project, and his his thesis on Burgess spaces grew out of that. So it's. Um, so, so they're really kindred spirits, and I think the dendrol deserves a lot more attention. Again, it doesn't, people don't think about it that way because when they, they did it, they didn't promote it as a discovery system. Uh, even though uh, Ed Feigenbaum had also worked with Herb Simon and certainly knew about Herb's views on, on the scientific discovery as heuristic search. Finally, then, we've, we're talking about generating process models. Um, here, you're given entities described at different points in time. It doesn't have to be. It could be a steady state system. Uh, but you want to call it a set of interacting processes that explain their behavior. Things like uh, like plate tectonics, where you've got structure, but how the how the structures are moving, which direction, and so on. Uh, inferring metabolic pathways, um, uh, inferring the the transitions, how how stellar evolution occurs, and how you go from one type of star to another. Again, there's been some systems on this, not nearly as many as equation discovery. I'll tell you about MeChem in a bit. Uh, ACE is a system, very interesting system, pretty recent, um, that infers, uh, that comes up with explanations for how landform, geological landforms were, how they came to a B in terms of floods and, and things like that. Um, and this is interesting because it actually has, uh, comes up with arguments for and against each process model. Um, this is, all, this is uh, work by Stephen Muggleton at Imperial College and, and one of his students uh, where they're inferring uh, networks of predation among invertebrates in, in, in field. This is based on relative abundances. 
And the systems, a, a bunch of work that I did on something that we call inductive process modeling, where a lot of one example was where we were in, in, inducing ecosystem models um, in lakes. Let me show you briefly MECAM. This was this was this was uh, pretty. Valdez Perez put a lot of work into this. He collaborated with chemists. He built an interactive system where chemists could introduce, specify the problem. The problem was um, you got you got some input chemical inputs and some chemical outputs. You want to find what the reaction pathway is. Um, it had a lot of knowledge about about chemistry, uh, but the user, a lot of that was in terms of constraints, and the user could turn off or turn on the constraints, and uh, and so it would uh, and it did a it did a it actually did a constrained exhaustive search trying to find the the simplest pathway to explain things, but it would come up with 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 things like this. Um, and and like like dendral, this led to publications in the, the chemistry literature. Um, I'd say that Raul was was disappointed because he didn't get more chemists to pick up on it afterwards. Right when he was collaborating with him, it it it, uh, it they they were able to use it. But I think it required handholding. And I think that, that if you want to build AI assistance for scientific discovery, I think that we're this is an issue we're going to have to have to to address. I mentioned my work on inductive process modeling. This is where you've got multivariate time series data. You've got some background knowledge about the kinds of processes that might occur. For example, predation, nutrient absorption, remineralization, um, where you, you know what kinds of variables are involved and also candidate functional forms, but not parameters. And you don't know what processes are involved. So there's many different processes. Um, so the, the, a model is a set of differential equations that are organized into these processes. And it drew a lot. It was inspired by Ken Porvis's early work on qualitative process models. Uh, these are just qualitative process models. And we searched through the space of these models uh, to, to try and explain the data. And I, and I wanted to show you this because, well, yeah, and here are some, some results on all on real data sets from this is the space station power grid. This is uh, experimental data on paramecia. This is some the levels of a, of a lake. This is an experiment, pulse response experiment in biochemical kinetics. Um, and we also had some results on aquatic ecosystems. Um, but, oh, and, he, and, and I wanted to, to, this was one of the more recent results that we have. Where I, this was on synthetic data where we constructed a, a 20 organism food chain, right? So, so A, a feeds on B, B feeds on C, and so on. And and this is what the time series data look like for, for this, this interactive system. And 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 this particular system, which is a, it's a process modeler that uses regression, lin, multiple linear regression as a subroutine, um, is able to reconstruct that 20 organism food chain from this. And it's very efficient. Um, and uh, it it's uh, I was I was impressed that we could do this. But right. So those are those are the five elements. Now let me move on to to what I see as the challenge in building integrated discovery systems. So I would I'm going to argue that there there are five main challenges that we need to address. Um, and I'll just go through these one at a time. There's there's been some effort some efforts on each of them but not in full form. We need more on, more work. The first is that scientific discovery always occurs in some context. Context that is, that it, for example, in, in doing law induction, you assume an existing taxonomy. For doing process modeling, you already have some law-like elements like processes that you can use as, as building blocks. The obvious thing to do is to Built a cumulative system where you use the output from some models modules as inputs to others, right? This is the story I told you at the very beginning, where in chemistry, the taxonomies preceded the qualitative laws and so on. Of course, there could be feedback loops, but mostly it's a feed-forward process. One example, partial response to this was uh, Bern Nordhausen's thesis with me when I was at UCI. Uh, he built a system called IDS, stood for Integrated Discovery System. Uh, it created a taxonomy from observed qualitative states like that HCL and NaOH decrease when they're brought together. 
and NACL increases. Uh, and induced qualitative laws uh, about relations among states, for example, that, that they will continue to change until one is consumed. And then it found numeric relations on top of that. So each layer of description provided context for the next layer. And this is, so this is, this is the taxonomy of quality of states that it found. Um, and and, and these, these links here correspond to quality of laws. The, the, this state is followed by this state. And then this is a variant of that where you actually have numeric laws, the constants and, and equations attached to these things. Again, this was only possible once you found the qualitative laws, and those were only possible once you have, as you were building the taxonomy. A second challenge is to revise laws and models. New observations become available over time, and so you're really talking about an online activity. Batch processing is not gonna, gonna make sense for extended operation. And that's a challenge for these cumulative approaches I just described because uh, you don't want to rerun the, everything from scratch. You want to just find which pieces of the, of the law or model you need to change. And the natural response here is to, to store dependencies, as in truth maintenance systems, right? So you say, well, this, this result here is dependent on these pieces. So if, if that context changes, then you only have to change this. The rest is, is unaffected. And I've done some work on that in with with process models as well, but I won't tell you about. A third, and there's a lot of excitement about that these days, is, is what's sometimes called closed loop discovery, uh, where you merge dis discovery process with experiment design and execution. Um, and there's two broad types of that. The kind you find in knowledge lean domains, where, for example, finding numeric laws, and in knowledge rich, rich domains. Um, so Bacon, as I mentioned earlier, um, would vary one variable at a time. So it would find a law like PV is, a, is the constant C1 uh, for, for, uh, for uh, one, one, uh, one number of moles or C2 for a different one and so on. And then it would try to relate these parameters to the number of moles and it would get a law like here with it. Well, there was a, there's a, a parameter um, and it would do the same thing. It would find a different parameter here. And then eventually it would, these were for different temperatures, and they would combine them, and that all comes together into the ideal gas law. Zitkoff and his Fahrenheit system uh, extended that idea, um, and um, this was again the data from an electrochemistry laboratory he had, uh, automated laboratory, um, and he was finding not just laws but boundaries on laws, laws that describe the condition, the, the boundaries under which laws help. When you get to explanatory domains, things become more interesting. You don't have to do this sort of mindless, very one thing at a time. You can be much more hypothesis driven. So Hikata was a system that uh, Kokarni did for his thesis with Simon, uh, where he he uh, read up on the history of Krebs research on the urea cycle and reproduced and built a system that reproduced many of the steps, which were largely driven by surprising results that he would he would be trying to do this, and then something weird would happen and would go down some other path. Um, more recently, uh, Ross King and his colleagues have built a system called Adam that does closed loop discovery uh, for uh, the growth of yeast. Uh, they're actually refining, improving models for metabolic regulation of yeast growth. Um, but this was a, arguably, Fahrenheit was the first robot scientist but I would, but I would uh, say that, that Adam is a much more impressive and rich robot scientist, and, and Ross is still continuing to do this work. Now, there's a lot of talk these days about self-driving laboratories, which is really, could be closed-loop discovery. Most of them aren't building scientific, producing scientific models as output. They're really just trying to optimize something. And I would say it's fine, it's good work, but I would, would not not call it discovery. Oh, here, here's a... Here's, uh, well, this is just a, a slide about, about Ross's work on oxytropic growth models. Uh, but it's definitely, his, his, his stuff it definitely has causal models, um, and it really is combining all the pieces. And he's, and he's, he's got some, uh, some ability, a new, new machine in collaboration with a researcher at Vanderbilt, where they're going to be able to collect a lot more data. Another challenge is measuring and actually identifying variables. Um, and again, there's two types I want to distinguish. Uh, there's 
been quite a bit of work on using machine learning to what I would say uh, to build virtual measuring devices. Uh, this is where you know what you want to measure. Or, um, for example, uh, the Skycat project in the early 90s at Caltech, <coughs> um, the JPL, uh, had, a, had a, a photographic sky survey with billions and billions of stars. And astronomers wanted to know to be able to catalog uh, which ones were stars and which were galaxies. And so they, they, they built a, they, they used simple uh, image processing techniques to get extract features. And then they built a bag decision tree um, uh, to do that. And then that got used to automatically catalog billions and billions of these stars and galaxies, which then supported scientific research. A more recent example is some work that uh, came out of Purdue uh, on material science, where they're using convolutional neural nets to uh, to detect what are called nanovoids, little, little blank areas in, in the materials. Um, these are, I would say that these are useful to collect, to generate data that you can then do discovery on. but. It, the decision tree here was not something that an astronomer would say, oh yeah, that's scientific knowledge. It's something that would be useful, but I would not call it call it discovery. In, in contrast, there's other stuff that I say does, does count, um, particularly in the context of equation discovery. Um, the IDS system I mentioned was introducing intrinsic properties like Bacon did. Uh, so that's inventing new variables in order to support the discovery process. More recently, there's work that's come out of um, this is out of uh, 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 Lawrence Livermore National Labs, and Fries et al. have a system called LASD. It's for latent cement. They identify with time series data, they identify latent variables, a lot like principal components analysis, but over temporal data. And then they take that small set of variables, and then they, they use something like Cindy to, do, to discover differential equations over those. And then they can actually convert back to make predictions in the original space. Um, so this part, the I would say, is non interpretable But the the intermediate part, where they're finding these laws, is. And other people have done done work like this too. So this is a, this is not very common. I think it's a really important and challenging idea. And then there's um, interacting with human scientists, which is. I mean, we don't just want to automate this. We want the discovery process. We want to be able. Humans, most scientists don't want to be replaced. They would like power tools to help them do their job better. Um, There's some examples in discovering taxonomy and causal models and process modeling, but we need much more. My position is the first step is to do a cognitive task analysis in the spirit of Newell and Simon to identify what the elements are, uh, what their inputs are, what their outputs are, and to see which of those uh, you want to automate and which to reserve for humans based on how hard they are, uh, how, how good our automated tools are for each of them, um, um, how much people want them to be automated, and so on. Uh, and I should just clarify, it's not just these large-scale things. Within each of these, there's things like you could imagine the system generating candidate laws, but the human has to make the selection, right? So, or you could have the human generating them, and the system is, is evaluating them. So, so for each of these, it's, you need a fine and grain analysis to figure out uh, where these are. Okay, you have about six minutes left. Yep. Make sure you leave enough time for questions yep. as well. And okay. Uh, this is the this is a system called Prometheus that you did inductive process modeling, uh, and it was interactive. And the user would could put a process model in themselves. They could then give it data. They could specify what to what to consider changing. They could track where the models were. Um, and we and uh, so that's one example. Last challenge is evaluating these things. And, and, and I have not thought deeply about this, but I, I, I know that there are two general approaches. You can build synthetic environments that obey known principles, as in science world, now discovery world, that you guys are developing, um, where you have laws of chemistry, electricity, thermodynamics, and others. And now when you, you have a system that discovers knowledge in that environment, you can see whether it's right or not. You can see how complete, how much coverage you get. Okay, but then there's natural domains too. If you want to have sort of people to believe that this is really going to work, you want to test it in some some scientific domains that are, that are not where they're not very well understood. And I'm thinking about things like material science or 
gut microflora, which is a, a pretty new, unexplored territory. Astronomy, although it's the oldest science, is still getting new data that people don't understand. Uh, so here, you have to measure predictive accuracy because you don't know have the known targets. Uh, but uh, but you can get humans to rate understandability and plausibility, and I think that's an important part of the evaluation. But any viable test that you you really want it to support all the facets of discovery that I mentioned and to provide ready sources of data. So to summarize then, I made three points. Discovery has many facets. The past 50 years have seen major progress on automating individual elements, but the integrating them and combining them with others like experimentation and variable creation, those are key challenges to the field. And we need more work along these lines. It's very much in the spirit of, of the early AI movements, which was all about building audacious integrated systems. Thank you. And here are some references. Questions? And I didn't mention the great role that literature has to play in discovery. Uh, I could tell you some stuff about that, but I obviously ran out of time. So I have, I have one question for you. Thank you for sure. the fascinating talk. <clears throat> uh one question is okay so thinking of scientific papers and scientific inventions i would argue if i'm understanding correctly that nearly all of them are not coming up with new descriptive laws or you know this um, descriptions of inductive proceeds etc so how does the typical scientific invention that doesn't end up with a new law um, fit into your framework. Well, so it sounds like you're talking about constructing artifacts, which is generally considered engineering and not science, but certainly creating new measuring instruments is a key part of science. Um, there's been very little work. Oh, so, I mean, so, so let's think of, let's take an, a new landmark AI model. And let's say I have an AI assistant that can generate new AI models for me. Are those not considered science? Could you give an example? BERT. Okay. GPT. Yeah. Are those artifacts that are kind of second class science in, in, in this framework? So there are there are different views on AI research. Some people view science as a primarily engineering discipline. Some people view a, sorry, view AI as an engineering discipline, some view it as a scientific discipline, and I say mm -hmm. it depends on your attitude. Uh, if your goal is to uh, explain phenomena in computational terms, mm -hmm. uh, as many AI systems did, particularly ones that were designed to model human cognition, uh, then of course uh, they count. Uh, if, if the goal is not to do that, um, then, then it's not clear how you would evaluate them as scientific contributions. Um, now, mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons why I pushed on experimentation back in the late 80s and early 90s for machine learning was I was hoping that machine learning would become a scientific discipline with, with principles that would say, for example, how does, um, what features of, of data sets and what features of the algorithm led to what features of behavior, uh, like robustness to irrelevant attributes and things like that, robustness to noise. Generally, that has not happened. Uh, it could happen. But if you look at the behavior of the of the the AI researchers and the papers they publish, it doesn't have a scientific feel to me. So it could, but most of it does not. What about the microscope? Let's say I had a, a, yep. a AI system that can generate the microscope. Yeah. That's also I, an I artifact. Say, it's not. A... I would say that that would I would not count that as discovery per se, but but I would count say that that if we want to understand the entire scientific research enterprise, then we definitely want to include that. Just like introducing new variables that or, or running experiments, you don't think of about designing an experiment as discovery itself, and yet it can be essential to the overall discovery process. So for sure. And, and the only person I know who's done some work, did some work on that was Jan Zitkoff, who unfortunately died 20 years ago. Uh, but he, but, but he, he th thought about that and wrote a couple of papers on it. And I think that's a fascinating topic. And I would love to work with you on it if you have ideas. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Anyone else? 
Uh, the power nope. we're out of time. Okay. So I'll have to stop at this point. Um, thanks again for the talk. Around the book. Really wonderful. Uh, thanks so much, Pat. Sure, Dan.